Okay. Uh, so last class we were discussing about the cerebrospinal fluid and how it goes around the brain and spinal cord, uh, goes through the the ventricles, right, and uh, keeps and has all these properties. It, it gives protection. It keeps the brain buoyant. It helps the excretion of waste products and endocrine medium for uh, brain and so on. We talked about hydrocephalus. Uh, you know where uh, there is increased fluid pressure in the CS7 because of that, the ventricles expand. Um, so this you see is generally in small babies because the skull is uh, is a bit soft, right? The bones that form the skull uh, don't uh, you know kind of are not too hard and don't get fixed among each other you know, with, the, with each other you know, in a very rigid way. So therefore, it's more flexible. Therefore, uh, this increased fluid pressure. Uh, CSF pressure inside the brain tends to expand right, uh, the brain, sometimes even the skull. Okay, at this point, I want to take a small diversion. Uh, it, okay, this part is not going to come for the exam, so you, know, you can take it easy. So I don't know if you're following news. Uh, there is a huge uh, climatic aberration going on in the U.S., especially in southern part of U.S., in the Texas and surrounding areas. I mean, Texas, uh, I've lived there for 10, almost 10 years, and there was never snow. But now huge snow, whole state is under snow, and it's really scary, right? So people are saying that this is because uh, some problem with this, uh, some of the ocean circulation, ocean current circulation. So this is called thermohaline circulation. Now, what has that got to do with uh, CSF? That's what I want you to tell. So there are these uh, you know, deep ocean currents which circulate all over the, all the oceans. And they connect the waters of all the oceans, and these are very slow currents. Apparently, they take uh, about thousand years to make one full circuit, right? And uh, the this video says uh, this is a video. You can watch it later. These are called thermohaline circulation because it is driven by the density gradients in the ocean, and density gradients happen because of uh, you know level of salinity, right? So if uh, and salinity also changes because there are two kinds of circulation. One is thermo, that is uh, the water on top will be heated by the sun, so the surface water. So therefore, uh, 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 it will be. So thing is, lighter water goes up and you know colder water sinks. So that creates a thermal circulation. And the other thing is uh, this kind of a density gradient uh, across space from one point to another point also drives uh, circulation. So you know convection currents, right? Where if you heat a bottle of, you know, heat a kind of a beaker of water, it will form you know, convection rolls. The same thing here is happening, but on a global scale, on a spherical geometry, and is constrained by the presence of continents. So you, it has to flow only through the corridors of the the ocean shelf. Now, so that looks a lot. I mean, I haven't really thought through it or anything because I just saw this video yesterday on the news, and. Uh, so there were even certain uh, kind of doomsday scenario predictions, which say that this whole you know, current can stop at some point in future, and that will give rise to huge uh, disruption of right in the whole planetary you know, climatic system and things like that. Now then that I, I then I had a thought. I mean, what about CSF? Will it also stop? What happens if it stops? So I just found this article which says that CSF stasis, that is CSF can circulation can stop. Uh, and apparently, it's, uh, it, it stops uh, on many occasions. So I haven't gone to detail, but it has a clinical significance. It can give us a lot of you know pathological conditions. Uh, and then, okay, so then there is a more recent science paper which just came two years ago. Uh, the title is "Coupled Electrophysiological Hemodynamic and Cerebrospinal Fluid Oscillations in Human Sleep." So apparently, in sleep, right the CSF waves are correlated with uh, low frequency neural dynamics or, or, or brain waves, you know, which is very, very direct uh, evidence to say that how brain activity and CSF flows right, are uh, closely coupled. So it, right, uh, you can also see this paper later. So the thing is, so the reason I am bringing up all these uh, points is, so normally you don't even talk about CSF. When you want to study brain's computation, you straight away get, get to the business. You talk about different brain areas and you know neuron function and things like that. But I mean, if you just stop for a moment and look at all these other things, this uh, you know this 
broader infrastructure of the brain then you might have a much grander theory of the brain you know you won't leave out anything so that so that's why a study of a brain brain fluid compartments uh, can be quite fruitful can give a lot of new insights so this simple cartoon picture shows what are the fluid compartments so there is first of all so if you this is the csf so this uh, all this light blue stuff is csf and this pipes running through it is the blood vessels the red red pipes and then this is the brain tissue proper so let us say this is let's say the cortex and any brain tissue but let's just say cortex and within this you have neurons right and uh, in the neurons you have again here there are two compartments so this is the extracellular space the space outside the neurons and this is the uh, interstitial space or you know, sorry, sorry sorry this is the intracellular space i'll call it ics so there are four four compartments csf right uh, so blood blood circulation or blood compartment and ecs and i said so there are four comp compartments and all the four are in you know close communication with each other there's constantly exchange of both water you know just just a just a base fluid right and also various uh, chemicals among the four compartments that's essential right uh, to support uh, ongoing neural activity so so now if you look at the particularly the vessel compartment the vascular compartment right uh, vessels actually you know there are so if you think of brain as some kind of a simple ellipsoid so there are four vessels uh, you know which are some roughly go like that okay so the two vertebral arteries and two carotid arteries i'll, I'll talk about this towards the end of the talk now these uh, once they enter the brain tissue they branch out extensively and if you look at a small patch you know like a small block of cortex right uh, you will find that uh, vessels actually you can and a good analogy of this is ac ducts in our rooms right if you look at how ac ducts uh, are organized in the in the, in the rooms you have this false ceiling right ac ducts uh, run through the false ceiling and uh, wherever you have a room then the part of the duct branches out and enters the room gets into the ac machine so similarly you think of the surface of the brain as some kind of a false ceiling the slightly the arterioles which are you know slightly larger than the micro vessels the capillaries right uh, kind of run over the surface of the cortex and at various points they dig through right the tissue the volume of the cortex and once they are inside right they branch out in smaller and smaller vessels now you can think of this whole thing as a few hundred uh, micron okay so um this is order of you know if you want right and uh, so if you now take a simple 2d section of this just a cartoon picture so what happens is like you know your vessel comes in and branches out right and uh, we have the neurons here so basically the vessels branch out to very fine scales so that uh, every neuron will have a micro vessel you know, sufficiently close to it close to it so you can think of it as some kind of you know your uh, power system so how you distribute power to the entire city right you will have power generation somewhere remotely so that's like your heart and uh, you think of your local substations you know for example for iit the substation in, in near the velachery gate and from there uh, it will branch out and you have power going to every room you know every house every room and so on so forth. that is that is that happens in the smallest vessels called the capillaries so at the level of capillaries is where the exchange of energy right energy is delivered to the tissue so the, it crosses so the energy the glucose and oxygen which is carried by the vessels crosses and reaches the cells uh, in the brain there is a even more special arrangement it doesn't cross directly to the cell there is a intermediary cell called the glial cell uh, you know or astrocytes right and, and the glucose and oxygen is picked up by the astrocyte converted to lactate and then that is then delivered to the neuron okay so that's a there's a different detail so now if you look at this whole block diagram of all these flows and all the interfaces uh, between uh, different kinds of compartments so input to the whole thing is this the, is the blood the arterial arterial blood uh, which comes into the cerebrum and spinal cord and even the csf is basically 
drawn out of the blood right it's simply filtered blood right and uh, so part of that goes through the uh, to one branch and this is in the the spheroid plexus right where uh, it is so out of this blood you have the cerebrospinal fluid which is uh, which is produced and that interface between the blood vessels and the csf compartment right is called the blood csf barrier so you know the meaning is quite obvious and this happens inside the structures inside the ventricles this is this happens in the ventricles uh, in the choroid plexus and this interface is called blood csf barrier now similarly the uh, another branch right the blood uh, from the blood you take all these nutrients uh, and then that goes into the, the interstitium or the interstitium is nothing but uh, the intercellular space the space outside the cells and between the cells that goes in there and from there it is picked up by the neuron cell body so this is the intracellular compartment of the brain so the interface between the blood vessels and the interstitium because now this is the tissue proper right that is called the blood brain barrier you might have heard of this term blood brain barrier often called bbb right which is a very important uh, which acts like a like a gateway like a gateway between gateway to the brain a gateway between uh, vascular system and the brain because this acts like a protecting uh, like a protective gateway because not every kind of junk can go into the brain from the from the vascular system from the vascular compartment so only uh, so for example this blood brain barrier, barrier keeps harmful substances out of the brain okay. so we'll talk more about that later so then uh, outside this you have post capillary venules and veins and cerebral veins um, so the, then uh, so on the csf side you have arachnoid villi we talked about in the last class the output of this then goes back to the proper venous system the veins right and then joins the circulation so something is taken out of the blood the nutrients on one side and the kind of more like the serum part of it on the other side the serum part of it goes into the csf nutrients nutrients go into the interstitium and from there it, they go to the cell bodies and again both streams join back into in the venous Uh, system of the vascular system so these are the interactions these are the interfaces blood brain barrier blood csf barrier between ecs and csf uh, so this so again these two right, in between so that is uh, this part ecs is this and csf so there is one interface right and uh, okay so uh, and between ecs and ics that is this part this is ECS and the intercellular part. This is another interface. So one, two, three, four. Okay. Now, blood-brain barrier. Its job is to protect and keep, you know, protect the brain uh, from harmful substances, uh, which have the potential of entering the brain from the circulatory system. And oxygen, glucose, and small nutritional molecules can penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Others are kept out. So and, and it's also necessary for maintaining a highly regulated homeostatic environment inside the ECS. So ECS is a very special environment, right? And a lot of parameters are maintained at strictly constant levels in the ECS. Now, because of the ongoing activity of neurons, certain chemicals in the ECS constantly fluctuate. But there are a lot of this regulatory mechanism which are constantly working to keep the levels of those chemicals at a constant level inside ECS. so you know you know the idea of homeostasis right and a lot of physiological parameters are maintained at fairly constant levels you know like your blood pressure and heart rate and so on and so forth now that homeostatic regulation uh, can be seen to be operating at a very high level of efficiency right in maintaining the ecs so this is a very important part of uh, you know of of, uh, of the brain and necessary for brain function and this kind of a maintenance of ecs condition is possible because of this uh, the interfaces with the other fluid compartments now blood brain barrier so thing is when you look at the uh, blood csf barrier we said that is located inside the choroid plexus which is located inside the ventricles on the contrary the blood brain barrier is everywhere everywhere in the brain but this barrier is not at one particular location this barrier is produced or you know physically it's implemented inside each microvessel inside the capillaries 
So what happens at the, in the level of capillary research? Uh, uh, so when you have the capillary, sections of the capillary, so capillary is also like you know, anything in the body is a bunch, is made up of cells, right? So even the vascular system looks like a tree. It is also made up of cells where uh, each cell forms one segment of the tree. Now, if you look at microvessels, neighboring segments are separated by a thin junction. Okay? And this is called a tight junction. And uh, this tight junction uh, has certain mechanisms which will permit certain kind of substances to come out. And the what is there outside is ECS. And this is the blood flow. Right. Uh, so this filtering that occurs in the tight junction, like it's like, you know, something is leaking out of the pipe. So there's a bunch of this long pipe is constructed out of small pipes and uh, junction point of small pipes has a leak and there's a deliberate leak. It is meant to be there, right? And uh, this leakage is where uh, the, some, the, the blood flow is filtered and only some nutrients and small molecules can come out of it and enter ECS. And this is called a blood-brain barrier. Now, uh, so increased number of mitochondria to support energy dependence. So sometimes some of this transport of stuff from inside to outside is, is energy mediated. You need energy to do the transport. It's active transport. And therefore, there are a lot of uh, mitochondria in sun surrounding this, uh, this blood brain barrier. So this gives again more a graphical picture of how this happens. Right? This is the arachnoid space. You know, this is between the so jira matter is here and fire matter is here. The arachnoid space, you know, which has lots of fibrous structures. So vessels wind through these fibrous structures, and inside that you have this glucose, oxygen, all these things can leak out of these little gaps. See that little gaps? Right? They can leak out of that and enter the ECS. Now, blood brain barrier is not perfect. Uh, it is missing. It can be breached. Uh, for example, there are these uh, regions called circumventricular organs, the so CVOs found in the third and fourth ventricles. So there, uh, there's no blood brain barrier. This kind of a tight control, right, uh, is not there. So then pituitary gland also, you know, doesn't have a blood brain barrier. And because of that, it allows pituitary gland releases certain chemicals called neurohormones, which have to enter the bloodstream. So if they are blocked up by the blood brain barrier, obviously it defeats the whole purpose. It cannot do its job. So the blood brain barrier is more relaxed, you know, in the in the pituitary gland. Hypothalamus also same story. It regulates, uh, you know, water levels, sodium levels, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, in, so it it, it uh, measures the you know the composition of various chemicals in the in the blood flow. So for that, it has to have be able to communicate with the blood flow. It, it cannot cut cut it out, right? So. So here also the blood brain barrier is breached and it's somewhat weak. And in newly born, in newborns, right, in the very early brain, uh, it is not fully matured. And this kind of maturation of blood brain barrier occurs only in the third year. Now, blood brain barrier is a protection, but it also becomes a weakness because if you want to deliver a drug to the brain, if blood brain barrier or a BQ blocks the drug, then how do you give drugs to the brain? How do you treat the brain? So uh, here, what they do is, so we know that the BQ uh, permits such certain chemicals and blocks certain chemicals. Now, so if you have a chemical which is blocked by the BQ, and uh, but you have to somehow deliver it to the brain, then uh, sometimes they give some other chemical, right, which can carry this, like it's kind of a smuggling basically. Some other chemical which can carry the original chemical, which by itself, you know, by you know, cannot cross BQ, but with the help of some other chemical, it's able to cross BQ. That is one strategy. Another strategy is don't give the original drug, but give some other molecule which can cross the BQ. But this molecule, once it goes inside, it becomes something else. It becomes like the original molecule which you intend uh, to take through BQ. Okay, this is the kind of things that you do to to breach the immigration, you know, uh, like at the borders, right? So something like that happens here. So one example is, uh, you know, for this is called Parkinson's, right? There is a shortage of deficit of dopamine, a substance called dopamine, right? In the in the Parkinsonian brain. Now, unfortunately, dopamine cannot cross blood-brain barrier. It gets beaten up. It gets broken up at the at the borders. 
So what they do is they give another drug called L-DOPA. L-DOPA is not dopamine and it can cross uh, blood-brain barrier. But once inside the brain, once it crosses the borders, it can be used, the cell can use it to synthesize dopamine. Okay, so that way the problem is solved. Another way to uh, breach the blood, the BQ is uh, the brute force way. Just, just poke a needle and obviously no blood brain barrier can resist a metal needle, right? So, so one kind of uh, way to do it is, so if you look at the spinal cord, right? And spinal cord is also surrounded by this fluid medium of CSA. Now, at the bottom of the spinal cord, so this is the tip of the spinal cord, and uh, this is the vein of the, this is the kind of the bottom part, point of the spine, the vertebral column. And uh, so at the bottom of the spinal cord, actually there is a fibrous tissue called cauda equina, which tethers, so you see that spinal cord doesn't go all the way to the end of the vertebral column. So there is still some empty space, which where there is just fluid and there is no cord here. Now, if you leave it alone like that, it'll keep dangling here. Because the rest of the places, it's kind of fits tightly. But this part is become where it becomes narrow, it leave, it, if you leave it, it'll keep dangling. So there is a kind of a nice cord, which tethers it uh, to the bottommost point. This, this fibrous cord is called uh, corda equina. Again, this is just some Greek or Latin, uh, Equina is a horse and corda is a tail, so it kind of looks like a horse's tail. That's the whole idea. So now, uh, within this, so these are the vertebrae. And uh, between two adjacent vertebrae, there is this fibrous tissue called a disc. You might have heard of disc prolapse, right? You might, I don't know, you might have had some, had some friends or relatives or somebody who had disc prolapse, so what's popularly called a slip disc. Right, that, that, that is, this is the disc which gets, uh, which slips kind of, which comes out a little uh, in kind of conditions of injury and people have pain and all that. So this disc is, a, is so this is bone, but this is not bone, this is fibrous tissue. So you, you can principle put a needle through this disc and uh, enter the CSF. Okay, so, so there is a point where if you can do it, below this point, then you won't be hurting the spinal cord. Otherwise you'll poke a hole through the spinal cord, that can be quite dangerous. The spinal cord is a very busy system. There's a lot of rich circuitry inside spinal cord. You don't want to randomly poke it with needles. So, so what they do is they use lumbar tap, uh, what is called lumbar tap. And uh, so it, I forgot exactly which, uh, yeah, so third, okay, sorry. So that is right here. Okay, the third lumbar vertebra, right? Uh, that's where you put this tap. This is the needle that I was talking about. And suck in a little bit of, the two things you can do, you can suck in a little bit of uh, CSF and use it for diagnostics, analyze it and see if something is going wrong. Or you can also in, like inject the drug because you wanted to inject a drug and breach the blood brain barrier, right? So that you can do by injecting the drug here and then it will circulate and reach the brain. So the two ways are two uses that you can, you know, of, the, of the, this lumbar tap. So you can take out a little bit of CSF and study, see if there is any, so for example, a neoplasm, you know, some kind of a cancer, a spinal cord cancer, right? Some loose cells floating around in CSF. Or cerebral hemorrhage, right? Hemorrhage is uh, basically a rupture of uh, blood vessels in the brain. If that happens, those blood, those, the, the leaking blood, right? Those cells will enter the CSF uh, circulation and you should be able to pick them up in the, in the lumbar tap. So you know that there is hemorrhage going on in the brain. If you find blood vessels in the CSF, that is bad news. Or meningitis, you know, I was talking about meningitis, meninges last class, the infection of meninges, then, uh, you know, you should find that, so that infection, trace of the infection, even in the CSF, or encephalitis, another kind of infection, so et cetera. Okay, so you can find the traces of some pathogens in the CSF and you can use it for diagnosis. For therapy, you can inject drugs like therapeutic agents inside uh, anesthesia. So, for example, there is this uh, this kind of anesthesia called epidural, which is given to pregnant women to help in their labor. So, labor, you know, is a is a very painful condition, right? Uh, women go through it, but it's actually a very painful condition. So, instead of general anesthesia, right, which will put the person completely in a sleep. Right, if you just give anesthesia here, right, just above the dura mater, 
right? That will enter the vessels and that will block the pain. So the person is conscious, but there is no pain in the abdomen and the lumbar region. So that's the that's the kind of thing that they do uh, in pregnant women. Such an injection of uh, anesthesia is called epidural. Now, blood-brain barrier uh, can also be broken by hypertension. Uh, you know, during development, again, like I said, it doesn't form well during, during early stages, early age. Hyperosmolality, uh, the high concentration of substance in the blood can open blood-brain barrier. Microwaves, radiation, infection. All right. Uh, so all these kinds of injuries to the brain can disturb blood-brain barrier. So many tumors have poor blood-brain barrier. Uh, again, I'm repeating myself, uh, meningitis can lead to damage to blood-brain barrier. And even genetic problems, the genetic disorders can give rise to uh, some impairment of blood-brain barrier. Now, we've come to blood CSF barrier, right? Uh, like I said, it was CSF is produced by extracting some kind of serum from the blood, and that happens in the choroid plexus, right? Uh, these are inside the ventricles. Now, I keep saying CSF is like serum, but it's not exactly serum. It's almost like serum. If you look at the composition of CSF and compare it with uh, Hello. Yeah, so if you look at the composition of CSF and compare with serum, uh, water level is 99%, here it is 93%. So main difference, most dramatic difference is in protein content. CSF has very low protein content. Serum has very high protein content. So therefore, in, in the when you do a lumbar tap and analyze CSF, if you find high protein content in CSF, then something is wrong. The filtration is not uh, not right, and something is wrong. Okay. Otherwise, most of the other uh, other composition of other um, chemicals is very similar. So between ECS and CSF, again, CSF flowing over the brain, extends into the sulci and right in the depths of cortex. Uh, and also there's this little, little spaces called virtual robin spaces, through which ECS, CSF can flow into the ECS. And uh, so small solutes diffuse freely between ECS and CSF in this perivascular spaces. Uh, and CSF and ECS are in dynamic equilibrium under physiological conditions. Now between ECS and ICS, this is a very interesting subject. And in fact, uh, so it is sometimes if one feels that you know to understand neural function, you should uh, 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 so to understand what is happening between neurons. Right? Let's say this is the two neurons talking to each other at, at a synapse. You should also know what is what happens outside the neurons. Right? This is the ECS, the right of the neurons. It's also important to know what's what happens outside the neurons. So this importance of uh, ECS, right, for a CNS function, that is central nervous system function, is brought out by a very nice uh, review paper, you know, in, by Psycho in 1997, right? Uh, to understand that, we should let us look at some basic facts. So ECS is the microenvironment of the neurons. So neurons don't just uh, you know, talk to each other without any external support. They are held inside this microenvironment of ECS. And like I was saying, certain chemicals have to be you know, regulated, the composition of the chemicals must be regulated very strictly yes, for neurons to function. And 15-20% uh, of CNS volume is ECS, so it's a fairly decent uh, volume. And, uh, and it contains lots of things, ions, neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are the chemicals which are used by neurons to talk to each other. Then metabolites, peptides are also chemicals uh, which neurons use to talk to each other. Neurons are uh, Neurohormones are also signaling molecules, which uh, not only neurons, but you know even other tissues also uh, can respond to them. So these are exchanged as a means of communication. Uh, so neurons can interact via synapses directly, right? Or uh, also indirectly through ECS, right? And uh, so this, so let me give an example of that. Okay, so by the way, so this is a cartoon picture of uh, CNS, right? So these are the, so this is a neuron. So this part is, uh, so this is the axon of a neuron. This is the tip of the axon. So where one neuron comes into contact with the another neuron, this is a second neuron. And these two, like I said, uh, two neurons 
have a small gap between two neurons, right? This gap is about 20 nanometers. So this is the synapse. So this is called the synaptic clef. A small gap. Now, when a neuron releases a chemical to talk to this neuron, this chemical not only goes to the target neuron, it also leaks out a little bit right, and can affect the other neurons. So, so normally you think of the brain as a very strict circuit of neurons where each neuron has like you no know, very special hotline with another neuron. So, you know, you think of it as a circuit, but actually it's not like that. And a neuron basically when it is sending out a chemical for communication, it is literally spilling it out uh, in the ECS. Whatever the neuron is spilling out, it is spilling it in the ECS. It so happens that the other neuron is very close to it and can quickly pick it up. But otherwise, this neuron is not injecting its signal into the postsynaptic neuron, into the target neuron. It is simply throwing it out into ECS, and other neurons happen to pick up. So the ECS becomes a medium through which communications among neurons take place. Right? Uh, so similarly, even the, uh, the other kinds of cells called glial cells, like astrocytes and all that. So there also, whatever is communicated from one cell to another cell, that chemical has to go through the ECS. So this is the ECS, right? And uh, then cross the ECS and go to another cell. So this is like the medium through which all these communications take place. And to appreciate how important this is, so normally when you look at some of these graphical uh, you know, representations, uh, you know, people, because now computer graphics is being used uh, extensively to communicate scientific ideas. People think of uh, neurons as right, nice circuit, and there is you know, this neuron talks to this neuron, this other neuron talks to this, and then talks to this another neuron. And so if you look at some of these uh, uh, pictures, you know, even in movies, when they show some you know, electrical signals flashing from neuron to neuron in the brain, they depict brain as if it's a forest where you know neurons are so far, far from each other and there's huge empty space among neurons and wires are going through the empty space and electrical signals are flashing through the wires. And there's a kind of graphical representation people are showing in even in movies these days, but actually it's not very accurate. Because if you look at a slice of brain tissue, which is called a neuropil, this is how it looks. We don't have huge empty space between neurons. They're all like you know, a bunch of kittens. You know, huddling uh, close to their mother, mother kitten, or mother cat, or mama cat, right? So now here, tell me, where is the empty space? Where is one neuron? Where is the other neuron? Where is the synapse? Where is the blood vessel? Okay, so in fact, uh, you can see that certain structures have lots of the small circles, right? These are the, what are called uh, the vesicles. Okay, so you can see that this must be the presynaptic terminals of some cells. So, so it is very hard to make out if you take a slice which is a neuron, where does one neuron end, where does another neuron begin? Okay, so it's all, there's very little empty space. So if one neuron sends out a chemical, uh, it will have to go through the ECS, right? There, there is, uh, you know, there's no option. Now this ECS, like I said, maintains certain chemicals at, you know, at very strictly con constant levels, uh, like for example, Sodium, you know, some of the ions present in ECS are important ones are sodium, chloride, potassium, and calcium. These are four major, most important ones. Sodium is maintained at 141 millimolar, uh, chloride at 124 millimolar, potassium is somewhat less, uh, so th uh, 3 millimolar, right? And uh, calcium is, is uh, also less, 1.2 millimolar. So what happens is when a neuron becomes active, because there is something called an activation of a neuron, all these chemical levels change because stuff goes in and out of neurons, right, from between ECS. So if this is a neuron, and this is ECS. When a neuron is active, stuff goes, so sodium goes from outside to inside, potassium goes from inside to outside. So lots of things happen. I'll discuss all this later on when we come to neuron function. So because of that, uh, transiently and locally, there's the disturbance of this composition. So what happens, there are lots of regulatory mechanisms where quickly it cleans up and uh, restores the composition so that there's always maintained at these, these levels. 
right so that way you see that uh, you know how how much the communication between neuron and ecs is going on all the time it's not that neurons are just talking to each other you know independent of everything else the neuronal communication is being made possible because of the constant interaction that it has right with the extracellular environment now there are even more dramatic ways in which uh, neurons uh, talk to each other right indirectly outside the synapse so the normal story textbook story is a neuron right makes a contact with uh, some other neuron at the structure called synapse and signal going from one neuron goes through the synapse and gets to the other neuron then so let's call this neuron a neuron b but actually neurons can affect each other even outside by directly uh, doing something to the ecs by bypassing the synapse okay let us look at an example so let us take uh, let, let's take an example let us imagine i have two neuron terminals one is like this and they're very close and because we have seen that they are all very close so i am drawing a picture as if they are very close this is the axon of one neuron neuron a the axon of one neuron neuron b now when this neuron gets activated so it turns out that for a neuron to get activated calcium calcium has to enter the neuron only then is the neuron will be able to send out signal okay so that is so calcium has to go in and where is calcium calcium is located outside ca2 plus now imagine the neuron a has just you know sent, sent out some signals so it takes up lots of calcium that is located you know in this neighborhood after a little while maybe after 100 milliseconds neuron b gets a chance to say something so neuron b starts uh, so the signal coming on neuron b and it wants to say something that is release a chemical and for that for releasing that chemical it needs uh, to have calcium rushing in calcium entering the terminal but what happened is because this fellow has just used up all the calcium there is no calcium available for neuron b to take in so because of that neuron b like you know it's like neuron b has something on the tip of its tongue but it cannot say it because it needs calcium coming in from outside therefore neuron b will be able to will will fail to transmit the signal that it wants to transmit right so you see that there is a strange kind of inter interdependency between neuron a and neuron b and that is how that there is influence negative influence inhibitory influence coming from neuron a to neuron b and that's not happening because of uh, synapse it is happening in extra synaptic fashion and it is happening because both a and b are dependent on this shared resource called the ecs right all neurons depend on ecs they constantly in, you know in exchange with ecs so nearby neurons uh, end up sharing the ecs resources and whenever two people share something there is a competition right there is they can inhibit each other in principle so because of that you know the co-dependence of a and b on ecs there is some kind of competition and that will give rise to some kind of inhibitory interaction among neurons and this interaction has nothing to do with synapse so to give an analogy to this uh, and let us imagine right you know this happens very very often in india especially when you whenever you have you throw a big party like a marriage party or something so imagine a street where you know you have uh, you know somebody is getting married and some rich guy and so big you know gala uh, kind of a function and so on so lots of uh, guests come and where do they park where do we park in india because we don't have, we don't have any parking space we just park on the road wherever we can double parking triple parking we just park all over the place so there is let us say there is this uh, this wedding party folks okay uh, or in this street this is a wedding party and uh, the visitors to this party park all over the road okay this is the wedding party and this is the uh, call this the dis disgruntled neighbor dn okay so the wedding party people who come for the wedding party they park all over the road and then just at that time this disgruntled neighbor somebody falls sick and they have to get an ambulance and how can the ambulance come where will it park it, can, it won't have any space this guy picks up a fight with the wedding party and makes a scene so this is a very kind of a common scenario i'm just making it up right 
So point is, why is there? Normally they are very nice, uh, you know, very harmonious and uh, affectionate and loving uh, neighbors. Uh, but uh, on this occasion, there's a fight because both of them are dependent on the shared resource of the street, right? And uh, therefore, once uh, the wedding party guy used up the street, the this disgruntled neighbor will have problem automatically. Okay. So something like that is happening here also because neurons are dependent on the external accessible space, right? And so therefore nearby neurons do have uh, some kind of influence on each other. So there are many such examples. You can you know give lots of examples either. If you like, you can read this paper. Now, uh, another thing is uh, transmembrane ionic fluxes are accompanied by movement of water. So it is not just flow of ions in and out, even there is flow of water in some situations. So, so for example, water can flow into glial cells, mainly one kind of glial cell called the astrocytes, and that can lead to swelling. And that's temporary. So it's a part of the signaling system, right? It's not just uh, you know, the electrical activity of neuron. There's also a lot of other things, concomitant changes that take place in other cells, other parts of the brain. Right, just to keep uh, the environmental conditions of CSPCS going on. So, so for example, in a spinal cord of a rat or frog, as a result of repetitive electrical stimulation, the ECS volume decreases by as much as 30 to 50 percent. That's a lot, right? Because ECS volume, uh, why is it decreasing? Because the water content of ECS is going into the cell, some of the cells, like astrocytes. The cells swell. But water content in the ECS has gone down by a huge amount. Why is it happening? Simply because of electrical stimulation. But so that uh, change doesn't remain forever. It persists for some time or even hours after the simulation has changed. But after that, it subsides and comes back. But in some cases, it will not even subside. For example, in some disease conditions, uh, there is an abnormal expansion of certain brain structures or abnormal shrinkage of brain structures. Now it is possible that these kinds of mechanisms, where certain of activation can give rise to volume changes, right? Imagine if something goes wrong in this uh, these mechanisms, those volume changes, both positive or negative, can remain for a very long time, and uh, that can be seen as a pathology. So if you take a brain scan, right, take an MRI of the brain, you will see volume changes uh, in certain disease conditions. So maybe these are the kinds of mechanisms. That are giving rise to such uh, long, long-lasting volume change. So how are the fluid compartments of the brain relevant to the brain? So we have seen that, right? ECS and uh, neurons are constantly in communication with each other, and ECS itself is able to maintain its composition because it's constantly dependent on this big, uh, you know, ocean sitting right next to it, which is the CSF. Right, and so CSF fluid and the water of the CSF and water of the ECS is constant exchange, right? The replenishment uh, and so on. So ECS undergoes activity dependent uh, transient local changes in the volume mediated by the flow of water, and uh, these volume changes shape the structure of the ECS. Okay. Um, so maybe. You Okay, let us stop there and uh, this now next topic is the cerebral blood flow. I think we'll cover that in next class.